Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah, alhamdulillah, hamdan yuwafi ni'amahu wa yukafi'u mazidah wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Allahum alibna ma anfa'una wa anfa'na bima alamtana wa zidna ilman ya kareem So Assalamu alaikum wa ta'ala We were discussing in the previous class uh, that we had together the first hadith from amongst the hadith that we'll be taking this semester and today we'll be taking the second hadith and that's the hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ speaks about the brotherhood the hadith goes as such you know Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu narrates that the Prophet ﷺ said الْمُؤْمِنُ لِلْمُؤْمِنِ كَالْبُنْيَانِ يَشُدُّ بَعْضُهُ بَعْضًا وَشَبَّكَ بَيْنَ أَصَابِعِهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم That a believer for another believer is like a building, like a structure. Portions of this structure, they reinforce the rest of the structure. So if you were to have a structure, and you take one brick out of the structure, especially from a strategic place, it could make the whole, you know, the whole structure collapse. So the Prophet ﷺ, what he's saying here, is that every single Muslim, every single person, is like a shepherd, and he ha- or even if he's not a shepherd, there is a void in society that he fills. So if he fails to do that, especially when it comes to his duties towards other Muslims, then slowly society and Muslim societies, or Muslims in, at large, will begin to deteriorate. And the Prophet والسلام, and Allah Azza wa Jal at large, tried to establish this meaning in the hearts of the believer time in and time out. Now, um, you look at the story of that young man, for example, the young Jewish lad, uh, you know, who accepted Islam at the hands of the Prophet ﷺ towards the end of his uh, his life when he was on his deathbed. At the end, the Prophet ﷺ said, "Sallu ala aqikum." You know, go and pray upon your brother. So he was trying to affirm and establish that Muslim brotherhood. Look, for example, when the Prophet ﷺ came into Medina, as the Sahaba they say, "Aha bayna." المهاجرين والأنصار that the Prophet ﷺ tried to establish from that time, from the get-go, as soon as the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, established that brotherhood and and sort of, you know, make it so that people are like brothers. Between the muhajirin, the, uh, the per- people who migrated from Mecca, and those that, you know, used to live in Medina. From the get-go, as soon as the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, one of the first things he did is try to establish that brotherhood between the two. And then, and you see when he did that, you know, slowly, especially in that time, and if you know Arabs, they're extremely tribalistic. But because of the Prophet's continuous efforts, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously praising this, um, you know, slowly, it actually worked. People actually used to treat each other like brothers. They would actually treat one another, you know, like brothers until a later time where these khilaf or these differences and these conflicts took another shape and tribalism came back into the ummah. You know, which could have several reasons. Wa alaykum as wa alaykum as So, which could have several reasons. Which could have several reasons. And especially uh, the conflicts that took place between the Sahaba. At the end of the day, if you look, it really had a tribalistic notion even behind it. This is what some of the ulama have mentioned. That if you look at the tribes which Ali was from, and uh, you know, which the conflicting party was from, you see that it might even have like a tribal, tribal it might even have tribalistic roots behind it. The reasoning for those you know, conflicts to take place. The Prophet ﷺ, however, came to destroy and destruct this type of tribalism that leads to problems. However, you know, people getting to know each other. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, you know, into shu'ub, qaba'il, لِتَعَرَفُ as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Qur'an. So that you may get to know each other. So tribal, tribes and, you know, uh, cultures, countries, cities, this is all part of life. So long as it's kept within the realms, it's kept just so that, you know, people can know each other and uh, the uh, ansab or the lineage doesn't get mixed and all of these kind of things, it's not a problem. But when it becomes... Uh, a reason or a catalyst to hatred, that's when, you know, problems occur. The Prophet ﷺ in this hadith, in another narration, rather, in other hadith, he gave a bunch of other reasons along with, alongside with akhuwa, brotherhood, okay, that may lead to this or that may result from this. So amongst the things, and I'll take little bits and pieces from this longer hadith, amongst the things he says is, لا تحاسدوا do not be jealous of one another. Now you tell me, is it possible for a person to be not jealous of somebody? No? It's not. It's very tough. It's human nature. It's human nature. Naturally, when you see somebody with a nice car, there is something that occurs in your heart. Naturally. Naturally, when you see someone with a nice watch, mashallah, isn't that a nice one? How much is it? Allahu Akbar. See, old is gold. <laughs> so he might, you know, have some sort of feelings. <laughs> what was that? Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. May Allah keep it alive. طيب. So, you know, it's, it's natural. There is a natural aspect to it. But what happens is when you naturally, for example, let me give you an example. You know, um, it might be a little bit difficult for some of us to swallow, but this is the reality of life now. You have um, every single uh, person has some sort of de desires to the opposite gender. Now, if this person goes and starts watching pornography, is that not going to increase and cause an influx in those desires? Of course it will. So, when you have this desire to sort of want what your brother has, if you cut the desire off from the get-go, from the start, then slowly you can start cutting off this desire. And it might, even if it comes, it might not go anywhere. However, you know, some people when they see, oh man, it really is good. You know? And another look, and a third look, and that's why the, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just in terms of even looking at that which other, others have, He said, لَتَمُدَّنَّ عَيْنَيْكَ إِلَى مَا مَتَّعْنَا بِهِ أَزْوَاجًا مِنْهُ Do not extend your gaze to that which we have given, you know, pairs from amongst them. Like what other people have, we're not supposed to be just, you know, constantly gazing at it. That's why, train yourself when you're in a car, you're driving, you see a really nice car, you know, a very luxurious car. And, you know, you, dr you, dr you, dr you drove in with, the, with an echo or something. If somebody has an echo, please don't mind. Or you drove in with a tear cell. And this guy comes with a BMW, whatever, or Lamborghini, whatever. Um, train yourself not to even look at it. And don't be awestruck when you see it. Because this will naturally cut off that natural desire and the innate feeling that an individual as a human being has towards the dunya. Because you cut it off from the get-go, you stop looking at it. Similarly, you know, just as we have Ghadd al-Basar for you know, lowering your gaze when it comes to looking at muharramat, women for, for men and men for women, you know, Lower your gaze from these kind of things as well. And you'll see that there will be a very you know, good, big benefit from this. That your natural feeling won't be nourished. It won't be nurtured. You won't be catering that feeling. You know, this is one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in this particular hadith. لا تحسدوا Do not be jealous of one another. And you see... This particular trait was the same trait that led Iblis, Al-Ain, Al-Rajim, to hating on Adam. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Adam and He gave him precedence even over the malaika, even over angels. And not only did He make him 
Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him with his own hands. After that, he had the angels make sijda to this man. Sijda takrim, honoring. Then Adam was taught all of the names. وَعَلَّمَا Adam al asmaa kullaha. And then Adam was taught all these names. So naturally, this feeling that was within Iblis, it took place and it slowly led him to, you know, doing what he did. It slowly led him to, you know, uh, telling Adam alayhi salam to eat from the tree which he was forbidden from eating from. And eventually, it led him to what? It led him to leaving Jannah or being thrown out of Jannah. And uh, it led him also to the ma'asi of Allah azza wa jal. To committing uh, disobedience of Allah azza wa jal. Some of the ulama they said ma'asiyah over here doesn't doesn't necessarily mean he was sinful, rather it could have it could have been, you know, something that he'd forgotten. And whenever you go against a commandment of a person, that linguistically is called ma'asiyah. So whether you did it forgetfully, or you did it intentionally, all of that would be considered linguistically ma'asiyah. So to call it um, disobedience. In, in, in the English language, it's you know, a difficult word to say. So whether you know, Adam السلام, was sinful or not, that's a different subject. But he disobeyed nonetheless, as in he didn't do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded him to, to stay away from, from that tree. Ibn Umar, Ibn Umar narrates that, and this is you know, found in one of the works of Ibn Abi Dunya, Ibn Umar narrates that Iblis told Nuh السلام, that there are two things that there are two things which I use to destroy and bring destruction to the child of Adam and what are those two things? the first thing that Iblis said I use to bring destruction to the child of Adam, he said, Al-Hasad. Why? Because through this Hasad, that connection of brotherly love and brotherhood is destroyed. And that's why when the Prophet والسلام, was saying, talking to the Sahaba, he said, The illness or the ailment of the nations before you has finally gotten to you as well. So, when asked the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he said, Al-Hasad, Al-Shahna, hatred and what? Hatred and jealousy. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Wahiya Al-Haliqa, and this is the one that cuts off. Al-Haliqa, you know, it almost sounds like halaq, you know. When you guys go get a haircut, what's the salon called? Halaq. Nowadays they call it salon, translating, transliterating from other languages. But, you know, they usually call it a halaq, where you go and get a haircut. So the Prophet, and this was a word even known at that time, when you say halaqa, it means usually to cut your hair. So the Prophet ﷺ, he said, لا أقول حالقة الرأس بل حالقة الدين. I'm not referring to that thing that cuts off your hair. Rather what I'm saying is it will destroy your deen. Because out of that jealousy, eventually it may lead you to leaving all of the hudud of Allah All of the boundaries that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said to maybe take revenge from this person that what? That you have jealousy towards. Any boundary will no longer seem like a boundary to you. And that's why it will be considered something that will cut off your deen. I want to share one story with you. Inshallah ta'ala with that, I will leave you off. And this story has a message. And that message is that deeds of such sort are of great value. And they can what? They can lead a person to becoming at a level of piety where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts his prayers and supplications. And this story is of Ibrahim ibn Adham, who 
was amongst the pious slaves of Allah Azza wa Jal in the past from our pious predecessors, Salaf al Salih. He was one day in another town, not in his homeland. And during his stay there, you know, he didn't have a place to stay one night. It was a cold night. So what he did is he decided to go after Isha and stay at the masjid. And then, of course, the gatekeeper of the masjid came, the guard. And he decided he wanted to close the masjid. So when he saw this man, he's sleeping there, or he's lying there, or doing whatever he's doing. He, the gatekeeper walked up to Ibrahim ibn Adham, and he said to him, you know, you have to leave now, we're going to close the masjid. So Ibrahim ibn Adham, he said, Ana ga, ana I'm a stranger here, I'm traveling. And tonight it's really cold. So why don't you let me stay here, and if you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you great reward for it. So he's encouraging him, one way or another, let me just stay here tonight, it's extremely cold. And this man, he wasn't ready to listen. He said, he said, you know, stand up and beat it. Pretty much that's all he said. That's exactly what he said. He said, قُمْ وَلَا تُكْثِرَ الْكَلَامِ Stand up and don't talk too much. <laughs> this was one of those rude guards. She said, you know, get out of here. Beat it. So Ibrahim ibn Adham, uh, and also the reason why he told him to beat it, if, you know, you want to use that word, is because he continued, he said, فَإِنَّ الْغُرَبَاء يَسْرِقُونَ الْحُصُورَ وَالْقَنَادِيلِ For verily, the strangers that come in, the, you know, previous experiences tell me that the strangers that come in ever, and live in this masjid, they usually end up stealing the carpets, and they end up stealing the, the lanterns. So I can't let you stay here tonight, I'm afraid you're gonna steal something. And this is a problem, you know, when... You're talking about a masjid here. Stealing from the house of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And a lot of these people that do steal and do these kind of actions, they don't realize that it will not only have a negative effect in their akhirah, rather it will also affect people at large. In our masjid, you know, by our house, by my house, over here, somebody, there was a... Uh, the people that come and fix your air conditions, they were called to fix the air conditions of the masjid. So what they did is, these people were really sneaky. What they did is, they fixed the air conditions from the outside. It looks really nice now. And nobody was there to watch over them, which is a mistake in and of itself. But at the end of the day, a person should have enough integrity, especially if he's a Muslim, not to steal from the mosque. But what they did is they took the air conditions and they took the boxes of the air conditions and left them there. From the inside they took everything. Put it in their trucks and left. And the company wasn't even a registered company. So, you know, the masjid doesn't even know where to go back to. And it's a large masjid, Jamia Mosque. There's several air conditions there. You're talking about maybe 10, 15,000 rals of, uh, of damage that they did to the masjid. On the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely ask these people. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, You will surely give every single right that you stole of anyone. To an extent that even a sheep that doesn't have horn will be given, will be given a counter for the times that that sheep that had horn beat her. So every single thing you do in your life will be written and on the day of judgment, ثُمَّ تُسْأَلُوا You'll be asked. Ibrahim ibn Adham here is not a thief, he's nothing, he's a pious man. So he tell, he's a really popular man at that time. He's like, you know, if you were to look for the biggest shaykh of our time and say that name, he's like that guy, everybody knows him. So he said, I'm Ibrahim ibn Adam. He told him, I'm Ibrahim ibn Adam. I'm not planning on stealing your carpets. And I'm not going to steal your 
lanterns. Just let me sleep here. So this man, he knew no Ibrahim ibn Adham, he knew no courtesy. He went up to him and grabbed Ibrahim ibn Adham by the leg and started dragging him across the masjid. You know, Ibrahim is in a tif, tough situation now. He's dragging him across the masjid, drags him outside of the masjid, and keeps dragging him. All the way, and face first. All the way, down to a little room, where a furnace is burning. Ibrahim is, where a furnace is burning. Ibrahim is extremely scared now. This guy, have you guys ever seen a bouncer? You know what a bouncer is? Imagine Ibrahim, you know, he's sitting in the masjid and a big guy like a bouncer comes and grabs him by the leg and drags him all the way to a place where fire is burning. <laughs> Ibrahim is scared. And he actually said about himself that I was really scared at this point. I don't know what's happening. So he threw him in that room. And in that room is one person, he's sitting there, and you can just imagine, almost feel what Ibrahim is going through now. He's sitting there and he's doing some work. Okay? And Ibrahim walked in, he's like, you know, kind of like, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah, you know, like, he's afraid. <laughs> From the corner, he's saying, Salaamu Alaikum. And this man looked at him, he's like, sit down. He didn't even tell him, sit down. He just kind of told him, go sit over there. So, Again, there's fire burning and you can hear the fire and this person is freaky. Why is he freaky? Because he's doing his work but he continues, why you can sit down? He continues to look right and left. It's a freaky situation. He's looking right and left continuously. He's doing his work but he's like... And he never returned his salam. He's been dr now Ibrahim has been dragged out of the masjid, thrown into this place with a fire where a man is just looking right and left. It's a freaky situation. And finally, the man stops doing his work. And when the man stops doing his work, he walks up to Ibrahim ibn Adham and he says, Wa alaykum as -salam. Or Wa alaykum as -salam. So, he says, pardon me. I'm a worker here, and the reason why I didn't start speaking to you, and I didn't reply to your salam, was because I was afraid that I'm gonna take from that time that I've been paid to work and start talking and getting indulged with somebody else. So I wanted to finish my work, and then I wanted to come and speak to you. So he said, Wa alaykum as -salam. And you know, this gave him a little bit of hope. He said, this guy is not so bad after all. But he's still freaked, about, freaked out about why he's looking left and right. So he asked him, he said, Okay, that explains your salam, but why were you looking left and right? <laughs> so this man says, That um, I was afraid. Ibrahim asked him, were you afraid? He said, yes, I was afraid. He said, of what? What are you afraid of? Because he's looking right and left as if somebody's going to come and kill him. So he said, I was afraid of death. And I'm not sure which angle that this death is going to come to me. And that's why I'm always paranoid about where it's coming from. Now, Ibrahim says, okay, so what are you doing? He says, I work here. He says, how much money do you make? He says, I make a dirham and a, and a half every single day. Half the dirham I use towards my own daily bread and my meal, and all of those things. And the one dirham I give to the family of my brother. So he said, your brother, your blood brother, from your father and your mother. So he said, no, it's not my father, it's just the person that I loved for the sake of Allah. And his children died, or he died. And his children and wife are still alive. So what I do is, I give that money towards his family, so they can take care of themselves. Ibrahim, he said, Subhanallah, this is Ibrahim ibn Adam, a very pious man. He's saying, this is an action of very pious people. Have you ever 
made a supplication to Allah. <coughs> Have you ever made a supplication to Allah that He's accepted? He said, I have one supplication that I've been making for 20 straight years and Allah hasn't accepted it. One supplication that I've been making for 20 straight year that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has never accepted it. So he said, what is that supplication? He said, my supplication is that I wish to meet Ibrahim ibn Adham, this pious man, whose mention is found every place in the world, and after that, I wish to die. So Ibrahim looked at him, he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has verily granted you your wish, and he didn't accept, it wasn't acceptable for him to grant you your wish, except that I come face first on the floor to you. And he said, subhanallah, right at that moment, he made dua to Allah azza wa jal, he said, O oh Allah, just as you accepted my prayer, you accepted the supplication that I made to you. فَقْبِضْ مِي إِلَيْكَ So take my soul and bring me to you. Because that's all I wanted to do in my life. You know, we make dua for all sorts of things. Cars, money, power, wealth, accumulating this, that. Here is a person making du'a for nothing more than what? Meeting a pious person. When Abu Musa, Abu, Abu Muslim al Khawlani came in to Medina, and Umar ibn Khattab and Abu Bakr met him, they greeted him with such great greetings. The only reason for that was they said, Alhamdulillah, all praises to the Lord, the one who gave me the opportunity to meet a person to, the, to which, to whom, the same thing occurred, that which occurred to Ibrahim السلام, Because he was thrown into the fire, and the fire didn't burn him. So this man is making dua, supplicating to Allah day and night, 20 years straight just to meet a pious person. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't let his dua, whether it be at the middle of night. Why? Because he's looking out and watching out for who? His brother. For the sake of Allah Azza how are we with our brothers? I'm, this is not even a blood brother. His wife died. His, he died. His wife and children are around. Us, even if our own blood brother comes and says, you know, can I have something? Can I have some money? I have, can I just have a debt? Can I have a glass of water? Or maybe he just goes to the kitchen and grabs a glass of milk and we start looking at ourselves like, what is this guy doing? And this is a brother... Think about it. One and a half dirhams, okay? He keeps half for himself. How much is he giving? How much percentage of his income is he giving away in sadaqah? Every person is in their own realms. You know, he doesn't have a lot of money. And maybe at that time, dirhams might have been worth a lot, possibly. But how much is he giving? Two third of his income, all for the sake of brotherhood. إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً Verily, believers are nothing more than brothers. And you are all believers, so we should all come together as brothers. As the Prophet ﷺ did at the end of this hadith, and as I do right now, فَشَبَّكَ بَيْنَا أَصَابِعِهِ And he put his fingers together in this manner. وَصَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَى سَيِّدِنَا مُحَمَّدٍ وَعَلَى آلِهِ وَصَحْبِهِ أَجْمَعِينَ